we're dealing with unique circumstances, of course, and people are stepping up and doing things that they might not ordinarily do and trying to figure out where they can be the most help. Among those stepping up in this pandemic is Dr. Jane Philpott. Initially, she was working at a COVID-19 screening clinic. Now she's on the front lines at a home for adults with physical and mental disabilities. The former federal health minister is here in 30 minutes to talk about what she's learned about the state of our health care system and where that system needs to go from here. Also this morning, what's kept you calm in these wild times? Is it perhaps the family dog? If so, you're not alone. We'll hear how dogs have helped ease our anxiety. And later... I'm saying unequivocally, it never, never happened. And it didn't. It never happened. Presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Biden responding to a sexual assault allegation from former staffer Tara Reid in an election year like no other... And in the wake of Me Too, how Democrats are squaring Biden's denials with a desire to believe women. Plus, we remember the rock and roll electrifier, Little Richard. We begin, though, in your house a few months into homeschooling. How's that going? Good morning. I'm Matt Galloway, and this is an extended edition of The Current. For a lot of people, it's all a blur. The speed with which this pandemic turned the school year upside down, and for many, chaos has ruled. Parents figuring out how to be teachers, teachers testing the limits of their technical abilities, and students, well, let's face it, a lot of the students are playing a lot of video games. One of our listeners, Kiri Daniel, asked her two kids what learning at home has been like. Okay, what's it like to have mommy as your teacher, or sometimes daddy as your teacher? It's sometimes really fun, sometimes really hard. I don't like being stuck in the house. Slow day. And when my parents are around and you're doing work, they pressure you a lot. What about you? <laughs> it's fine. It's like fun. But... I don't get, like, that much work done, and I miss my friends, my teacher. I, like, miss my whole school, and it's hard. That honesty is real. It's hard on everyone. Some people are really struggling. Have a listen to this mom of teenagers from Owen Sound, Ontario. My 15-year-old son is getting lots of hours on his Xbox, and my 13-year-old daughter is the loneliest kid in the world. So... I don't know who's teaching them, but it isn't me because I'm not a teacher and I have a job and my husband has a job. So what do you do with those kids? There's nobody here to watch them all day and make sure that they do anything they're supposed to do. While most don't see an end in sight, we should mention that some students in Quebec are heading back to school today. This morning, we're asking what we've been learning from the past few months about learning from home. Caroline Oshino is a mom with two kids and a full-time job. She is in Halifax. And Kamiko Shibata is a teacher with the Waterloo Region School Board. She's in Kitchener, Ontario. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Caroline, that mom we heard just a second ago is really struggling um, and talked, I think, in a pretty honest way about what a lot of us are going through and trying to figure out what this new reality looks like. What's it been like for you? How have you survived this experience with your kids? <laughs> well, I can really relate to, to what that mom was saying. Um, it's, been, it's been a real challenge um, when all of this first started and We got the home learning plan from uh, the government of Nova Scotia. I was really motivated to try to get a program going and get started. Um, You know, I had a binder printed. I had these boards for each of my children, but it it quickly fell apart. Um, It was too much for all of us. And so we've just decided to to pull back and to focus on a school of life type of activities. So what does that mean, school of life? Well, Of course, my kids, you know, they they also get a lot of screen time, but we try to focus on um, regular everyday things. They do laundry with us. They do dishes. They help with cooking. We try to get some outdoor time um, and we try to follow whatever interests they have. So if a question comes up, like last week, my daughter asked, why do we get busy when we spin? Well, we, we try to do a bit of research and, and learn that way based on 
uh, everyday situations that come up or, or questions that the kids have. And why, I want to bring Kimiko in to this in just a moment, but why for you ha- has that been a better approach than um, what you started out with in terms of the whiteboard and, and a very um, programmatic, if I can put it that way, approach to, to dealing with homeschooling? Well, my kids, um, I quickly saw that my kids, uh, it's way more than just worksheets, you know, school. So um, my son is in grade six, and he was having a really hard time um, focusing on what needed to be done with the with his assignments at home, um, getting all the resources he needed, uh, being able to, to, you know, interface with the technology. And my daughter, who's in grade three, um, I think needs access to her teacher and to her peers in school and, again, to all of the resources that are normally in a classroom that I just can't offer as a parent. Um, I'm also working full-time, you know, managing the household with my husband. Um, we have other things that, that require our attention. Um, so it was becoming really stressful and really difficult, and things were getting really tense. And I just thought, my kids are not learning optimally if everyone is is really tense and stressed out. Um, so we're just going to pull back. We're going to make sure that they read every day, that they connect with their teachers mm. when they have their Google Hangouts. But otherwise, um, we're going to take a more relaxed approach. Kimiko Shibata, you're on the other side of this as a teacher. Um, what has it been like for you to pivot to, to teaching online? Yes, well, actually, I can relate as well as a parent, because I will be completely honest, we are not logging on to my daughter's classroom every day, because like you, as a working mom, I can't be at all of my online meetings, assisting all of my students and their families, while also helping her to do her work. And we know that young children are not independent online learners. I have a little one in kindergarten, and everything that she does has to be done with me together. And so there's days we just don't log on, and we don't get everything done, and I'm so glad to hear that you understand that whole school of life, right? Like, we do need to validate the learning that's inherent in basic household tasks, measuring out ingredients for baking and cooking, going for nature walks, writing about and taking pictures of animals and insects and plants, watching how they change and grow, and really tapping into kids' interests. Because my daughter as well, she's very interested in a lot of sort of science topics and things and animals. And when we, we can just easily mm. research things that she's interested in, read those books. And she's doing so much learning. It's not always the learning that's, ha- that's set out for her to learn in her classroom. And that's okay. How ha- I think we need to be really reassuring parents of well, that. How has that shaped, as a teacher, what you're providing to your students? You teach um, ESL. English yeah, is second so language. I work with... Yeah, so my students are anywhere from kindergarten to grade six, and really tapping into interest has always been a passion of mine with my students. So for doing writing, well, how about we're writing about something that you're interested in as opposed to something that I'm assigning to you? And the buy-in is a lot, a lot better when kids are given that open reign of choose your topic. What are you interested in learning about? How can I help you to learn that? And I am in a, you know, a specialized role, so I do have the ability to modify things for my kids that way. But, you know, I think during the middle of a pandemic, pandemic, the more we can offer kids, you know, their own student voice, their own student choice, Mm. letting them do things of of personal interest, the better learning we're going to get out of them at this time. Do you feel, just briefly, do you feel as a teacher that you're Mm. connecting with those students through the the online portal that uh, you're operating through? I do in a limited way. I'll be completely honest. This online distance learning, like this is not in any way replicating what happens in a classroom. This isn't regular times. This isn't a regular school experience. This is not even, you can't even call it e-learning. It's emergency distance learning. So it's not meant to replicate a regular classroom experience. Mm. You can't give kids that intense one-on-one and that small group experience, that guided reading experience, that immediate feedback that just it doesn't happen even when we're trying to integrate some video options and Google Hangouts and various things like that. We still won't be able to provide kids with the same thing they had in the classroom. So I think we just need to acknowledge up front this is a stopgap measure to get us all safely through this pandemic, but nothing about this is business as usual. We've been hearing from kids about what it's like to be in this new environment. Have a listen to this nine year old and, and what the nine year old said on a CBC call in show last week. It's horrible to have your parent as a teacher because there's no difference between school and home. And so it's it's homework, school, or like the school day, or is it just homework? It's horrible to have your parent as a teacher. <laughs> Caroline, you talked about changing your approach. How did you deal with the expectations that we as parents um, are under when it comes to this, this new reality? 
Well, uh, it started with taking a close look at what I, uh, what was my priority, really. And my priority was my kids' um, well-being and their mental health and, and also my mental health. So, mm-hmm. so with that priority in mind, um, it, it was easier to decide to stop fighting, you know, several hours a day about schoolwork and just choose a different path. I mean, it's, the expectations on parents are huge. We've, we've lost access to our whole village. Right of supports that we mm-hmm. normally can rely on, um, so parents have to play all of the roles in their child's life, and um, so I think that I try to, to give myself permission to, to just take one of those hats off and focus on on family well being and health and uh, and getting us safely through the pandemic. Kimiko, I could hear you in the background agreeing. <laughs> Here we go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. No, Caroline, I'm 100 percent there, right with you, right? Like, and we're in a situation. I, I'm, I'm assuming just from some of the things you're saying, like you are in a situation where you're not necessarily having to worry about where your next meal is coming from. And I'm hearing that you're, a, you know, a fluent English speaker. You're not probably new to the country. You have lots of privilege, and so do I. And if we're finding it hard as parents to to do that schoolwork and to deal with the stress that it's putting on our kids. I Just imagine, right, our newcomer refugee families, we've got families who are living with addiction and mental health issues. We have so many vulnerable and in-risk, marginalized families yeah. in our communities. Some don't have, you know, the internet bandwidth to participate or the technology. We have kids who don't know where the next meal is coming from. We have so many families that are going through really tough times that are just, the stress load on them is incredible. So they're in that sort of trauma brain right now. And as a society right now, right, we are all going through this really this collective traumatic experience right now. And everyone's feeling these very real feelings of helplessness, loss, and grief. Mm. And, you know, we're not, people are saying, you know, we're not in the same boat, but we're all in the same storm. So we all have different experiences in our homes. But What do you you say, Kimiko, then, to to the parents of of those students that you're teaching about those expectations? Because we hear from... um, parents, like Caroline, about how she's managing those expectations. But on the other yeah. side, what about what, what the teacher says uh, about how to manage those expectations? Well, my personal belief, and this is, again, this is not what the Ministry of Education are saying or whatever, but, or my employer, but my personal belief is that any learning in elementary school right now needs to be presented as optional, like the things that, are, that we're accessing through the portals, etc. I think that need, that message should really be to let parents relax a little bit, that this is optional. We're being given, you know, so far we've been given direction that marks are going to be sort of based on the things the kids did up until um, the school closures Mm. and that kids can improve their marks. But anything else is just um, that sort of formative assessment, assessment for learning, but not evaluating what kids are doing. And because not everyone's able to fully participate in this Mm. or wants to fully participate in it, I think it's fair to say, you know what, if your family is in a place where schoolwork is your 100% priority and you're in that place where you want to do things, great, we should be providing activities for you to do. However, if you feel like this isn't something you can handle right now, that needs to be okay, right? I think we just need to have that permission and extend that grace to families. It's okay that your kid... Is your kid reading? Are you reading books to your kid? Right. Are you baking together? Are you doing things together, spending time going for walks? Great. That's awesome. That's awesome parenting, and it's awesome learning. I think there's a lot of parents that will be happy to hear that message from the teacher as well. Um, it's great to speak with you both. <laughs> Good luck. It, it's a struggle, and everyone's in this, um, as you say, in different ways, but we're all uh, in the mix on this. Thank you both for talking to us. Thank you so much. Caroline Arsenault is a mom with two kids and a full-time job. She's in Halifax. Kimiko Shibata teaches English as a second language. She was in Kitchener, Ontario. Randy Labonte is an educational consultant and CEO of the Canadian e-learning network. He's been listening in from Half Moon Bay, British Columbia. Randy, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. How do you react when you hear stories of parents, like we just heard from one of whom who's a teacher, who's essentially said, you know what, I get what we are being uh, offered here, but this is not possible and we'll do what we can. I I have to say I was heartened to hear the words and the the direction that both Caroline and Kamiko have both gone in, in terms of saying, look at what your children are uh, curious about, capitalize on their inquiry. This is not... Uh, schooling. This is an emergency situation. I would go one step further from Kamiko calling it emergency remote learning Mm. or distance learning. I would say it's emergency remote teaching because it really is a one way. Uh, I've seen teachers go out of their way to try to build some type of a connection with students, a social emotional connection, 
So we have parades of cars going through neighborhoods. Uh, that's an important aspect. We're here, we're trying, we're doing our best, but this is not typical schooling. And this is not e-learning. We've been hearing from students. We asked our listeners for their thoughts. We got a note from a grade 8 student named Ryan. He wrote that one of the good things about online learning is that he has more confidence using technology now, says he can manage his studying time and focus on subjects that interest him. But he said he misses his friends, and remote learning makes him lazy and disorganized. How typical do you think that is of the experience of students right now in this new universe? Well, I, I would say that that's, that probably summarizes it quite quite well. Uh, the recent uh, surveys and studies have shown that probably less than than a quarter of the students are actually actively engaged with their teachers in some capacity. And I know from my own uh, perspective, uh, I've got uh, grandchildren, and I know that one of my daughter's uh, children is an avid reader. She connects. She does all of her work. She is bored. She misses her kids and friends. Uh, in that, but her younger brother doesn't connect. He sits on a chair and spins around when he's supposed to be in front of a t- uh, screen, and for the most part, he just kind of twiddles around. I think in terms of my days in elementary school, uh, I needed to connect and understand what the, the, each of those children that came into my room were about, uh, and I had the advantage of having the, the whole physical connections, all of the social-emotional connections that occur when we're physically in the same space, and mm. that is different online. Not to say that you cannot build those connections. It's just completely different. It takes a different mindset and a set of conditions and, and learning experiences. So the fact that uh, there's some confidence in using technology, I think, is the positive we have to take. But when we look at what we're going to do in September in, in education, I think we have to expand to the digital learning environments, but not expect that it's going to be the be-all and end-all. Technology and e-learning is not going to solve this problem. The best learning that occurs is the connection that occurs between the teacher and the student, or as in Caroline's case, is between uh, the parent and the child. Mm. There are a lot of people who see this as um, a foreshadowing of what may come when it comes to the future of education. Here in the province of Ontario, there's been a great fight over um, mandatory e-learning, and that's being uh, replicated in, in other jurisdictions as well. Have a listen to Daniel Ansari, who's a professor of psychology and education at Western University in London, Ontario, holds a Canada Research Chair in Development Cognitive Neuroscience, and has real concerns around um, what this might do when it comes to the future of e-learning. There has been for a long time a great enthusiasm around e-learning, but many of the attempts have failed miserably. Uh, Smart boards that were rolled out across schools and universities have not been utilized in the way they were expected to be utilized. Uh, The idea of bringing iPads into elementary schools hasn't really flourished in the way that we expected it to. So I think there are some real risks here. Uh, When I hear people talk about reimagining education, an e-learning revolution, I get worried because I don't think this is an ideal condition in which to bring that about. Something like that requires evidence. Mm. It requires a more gradual approach, in my view. Randy Labonte, what do you make of what uh, Daniel Ansari was saying? Well, I I would tend to agree, but the the, the argument is technology solves things. It's not. Technology is just another medium by which a good connection happens between a teacher and a student. So the pedagogy, the the instructional, the the learning situation is critical. Does technology expand our uh, palette of options as teachers and educators? Absolutely, it does. Can we use technology effectively? Well, if we think that technology is going to solve a connection or a problem, it, it, it isn't. And that's the issue about smart boards and iPads. It, it's about technology that's going to revolutionize. No. Teachers and how we utilize mm. some of the tools and the resources that us change. And all of the research uh, that's been compiled over the many, many years say that it, definitely teachers and the structure about how you create learning is what's different. What I was hearing with Caroline and Kimiko is focus on the individual, focus on their passions and their interests, get them involved and pursuing what they're interested in, and that is what will turn effective learning. But in the last 90 seconds that we have or so, I mean, take a look at what's going to happen, not now, but in September or October or January of next year. What do we need to be thinking about to get this right? Because school come the fall is not going to be school as we remember it from six months ago. We have to abandon some of our assumptions about the one-room uh, schoolhouse. 
we have to start thinking about the expansion of digital technologies and digital learning spaces. But what's the critical piece is how do we prepare teachers? Because in this emergency, they have done a creative and an effective job reaching out. But imagine what would happen if we actually prepared, teachers were trained, they knew how to leverage different, different technologies and learning spaces, and they planned for this. But are you going to be able to have that connection? If in September, kids are going back on a staggered schedule and they're there a week on or a week off or what have you, um, and there's still some e-learning, will you have that connection that, as you say, is so important? I, I think it can be done. I, I honestly believe that, and I believe in the, the value and, and the equity. The, the, the teachers themselves, I think, are, the, are going to make the difference. I think it's possible, but it takes some planning and it takes some patience, and it's going to take time in order to build this out and be much more effective. But I think technology can help us in this situation. Technology can bridge distances. Randy, good to hear from you on this. We're going to turn it over to, uh, to parents and students. In the meantime, thank you. Thank you. Randy Labonte is the CEO of the Canadian e-learning network. He was in Half Moon Bay, British Columbia. Would love to hear from you. What has your experience been like with this new world of education? We're a couple of months into this now. And are you like Caroline and Kimiko who have essentially said, you know what? The school of life perhaps is more important than trying to fight with our kids about how to uh, make this work. Or have you been able to make it work? We'd love to hear from you. Um, and what is the place of e-learning in the future of how kids learn? You can reach us through Twitter at The Current CBC on Facebook or through the contact link on our website, cbc.ca slash the current. Your experiences with this new world of education, please. Well, the CBC News is next. Then a conversation with the former Minister of Health, Dr. Jane Philpott. She now finds herself on the front lines of this pandemic. We'll hear why she stepped up. Coming up on The Current.